All right, um, this is our final block. I'm sorry for the delay and all the stress. Um, I'm not going to introduce the speakers because I screwed that one up yesterday. You could just introduce yourself. Uh, try to do it before I press play on the timer. Um, okay, I hope you're all ready. Don't get irritated by me snapping my fingers. That's their one minute warning. I hope you're all ready. Does this work? It works. It does. So, let's go. go. Cool. Hi, I'm Nate, and I'm going to be talking about sprints. Uh, a sprint is a group of free software slash open source people getting together to hack on something for a few days. Um, they're very easy to organize. Uh, basically, you book an office or a co-working space, and you post and choose a date when you want to do it, and then post online and invite people to come. That's, that's like the basics of a sprint. Um, you can also book a seller. It doesn't have to be an office. And you can limit uh, the amount of people to only a few, like maybe a 10 is a good starting point, or you can you know, make a bigger sprint. It's up to you. You're, you're the one organizing it. Uh, again, you just provide the desk and a good internet connection, and then people will come and, and, and hack on something. Uh, it's great if you can provide some food so people don't have to think about bodily functions and bodily needs. They can just focus on the code. Um, and the NixOS Foundation actually has a budget for this. So if you're organizing a sprint, you can ask, ask the NixOS Foundation to give you some money for, for food to feed people. Uh, oh, yeah, and coffee. Don't, do not forget about coffee. We need that. Um, there are actually two Nix sprints coming up shortly. The first one is Tiger Sprint in uh, Chiang Mai. In Thailand, you can see the URL right there, tigersprint.org, uh, accepting applications. And the second one is Ocean Sprint. Um, this is the one that I'm organizing. I've been, I've been doing sprints for 15 years, so uh, Ocean Sprint might be a bit over-engineered, slightly. Um, the venue is a private villa on Canary Islands uh, by the Atlantic Ocean, perfect climate, pool, lots of shade. Uh, we start the days off with a sunrise swim, just to wake up. Then we rent about stock pool requests uh, during breakfast, which is catered, so you don't have to think about breakfast. You just come to the sprint venue and eat and rent. Uh, we pair up on issues. That's, that's the main thing about a sprint, is that you don't work alone on something, because you can do that back home. You either convince someone to work some, on something with you, or you join someone to work on something. And that's kind of the the best part about the sprint is that you get to work with people and you learn from them. Uh, we, on Ocean Sprint, we get food delivered at the venue every day, so we can really focus on coding and not other, st other things, and we usually hack way, way into the darkness. Uh, sometimes we submit pull requests, pull requests. Sometimes we push from a boat. Uh, we hack when we go to a restaurant. Uh, and we keep our laptops open even after dessert. So yeah, it's intense, uh, it's super productive, it's fun, it's Ocean Sprint, applications are open. Uh, everybody that was ever in a sprint, hands up please. So everybody else, these are the people you can ask how, to, how, how it is to go to a sprint, do it, ask them. It's a really amazing experience. I still have 30 seconds, right? More, <laughs> easy. Uh, so Ocean Sprint is a bit, like I said, I've been doing sprints for 15 years, so it's a bit over the top. Sprints can be super easy. If you have an office, if, if you work at a company and you have an office or you can rent an office, just do that. Rent an office for a week or reserve an office for a week. Post it online on, on the forums and on Matrix and say, like, we're going to do a sprint in our town, our city, in our office from that date to that date. Who's going to come? And I'm sure people will, will show up, and then you're going to have an amazing week hacking on Nix. Now I'm done. Wow, thank you very much. It's nice to have someone be on time.
Does it sound? Yeah. You hear me? Yeah. Okay, don't cool. Start, don't start here. Extra time. Okay, I'm gonna count down. All right. Three, two, one, go. Right, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Hugo, I care about security, and I really like to use containers for that, and I want to share this with you. Um, so this is probably the most important folders on your laptop. Uh, if you look a bit at what you have there, uh, and if the animations work, you have a lot of cookies, like session cookies, and these session cookies authenticate you to maybe the cloud console you're using with all the machines of your work, your webmail that allows you to uh, get recovery passwords for all the, the, the software that you're using, maybe you're logged in into your Forge, maybe you're logged in on your GitHub with access to, commit access to Nix packages, um, maybe you have a web-based password manager, and you're logged in on all of this. Um, and it's not just Firefox, a lot of apps ha store secrets on your laptop. I encourage people not to do that and to use YubiKeys so you can ignore the SSH and GNU PG folders, but still you have a lot of secrets on your machine and these can be accessed by a lot of commands that you might run. Um, peep install, NPI, uh, all the supply chain attacks are very well known to be a big issue. It also works with Nix. Um, and so, uh, it, not just for like development environments, it's also for an issue for servers. Uh, many services that are pa packaged in Nix packages can have remote code execution issues, for example. Uh, for example, this one. Um, so, Nix OS containers can really help there. Uh, it's, it uh, allows you to isolate processes, but it's, and it's really easy to do, and that's what I really like with uh, NixOS containers. Uh, you can compare them to virtual machines. Virtual machines provide a bit stronger isolation, but that's also a disadvantage because when it's in a container, you can share devices directly. Uh, you can share the host networking, so you don't need to worry about NAT and stuff like this. Everything is on, still on a local host, but cannot access all of your files. Um, and you don't have to worry too much about allocation, like how much RAM do I need to give this container? Um, and so one of the uses is development sandbox, so you can decide to only provide access to the code repositories that you're working on and not to the rest of your file system. Uh, you still have all the files accessible from the host, so you can just use all the apps you commonly use to access the files, but also have them in the development sandbox. And you can have all of your developer tools available both in the sandbox and outside. And so what's very important is that it just feels like home. Uh, in terms of Nix code, it looks a bit like this. So uh, in this case, for my sandbox, I just don't start it automatically at boot. I don't have a private network. I share the networking of the host, so I don't have to worry when I'm on some Wi-Fi. Um, and then I bind mount just my Git repositories. And this helps with a command not found on Git when you type a command. And it says the not found. Well, if you mount this, it will not bother you with that. and will tell you what package you're missing. Uh, with flakes, it's useful to add these special args to pass the inputs to be able to use Home Manager if you want to use Home Manager inside the sandbox, which I find pretty convenient because that allows me to just re-import all my shell configuration, ID configuration, development configuration. I can just import the same everything in my sandbox and I can feel the same on my host, on my sandbox, and it's all synchronized because it's just the same Nix files at the end. Uh, you can have whatever packages you want. Um, and so Home Manager works in it. That's really nice to configure a lot of apps and have a reproducible development environment that you can also share with other people. Um, if you want to, it, it runs as, you need to be root to access many of these tools. So these are like the pseudo configuration so you don't have to type your password all the time. And some, you can have some shortcuts as well that make things very convenient. You just type send and you're in the sandbox. Uh, on servers, um, so it's a bit, the, the goals might be a bit different. What's important, what I like is that I can do easy backup and migrations with containers. 
Uh, you can isolate the containers network, so you can just give them a private local IPv6 address that's only accessible from the host. They cannot send data somewhere else on the internet. And then you can just run a shitload of stuff inside containers and see exactly how much data they are using. And you just need to back up this di directory to back up all of the state to migrate it to another Bye. server. So isolate all the things. Thank you. Nice. Testing one, two. Let me get my timer. Sure. All right, you ready? Yep. Three, two, one, go. Hi, I'm Edgar. I'm uh, bringing another container related talk. And today I'll be introducing a, a, a new way of producing Nix images, Nix container images. So I'm going to first give a quick primer on existing Nix. Uh, tooling for Docker images. The first one is from Docker Tools, build image. Um, basically all it does is it takes all the Nix store paths and put it in a single layer. You have a build layered image, um, stream layered image, Nix2 container, and all those kind of related projects. Uh, they put store paths into more layers, but because of a kernel limitation, you're limited to uh, at most around 100 layers. Um, they all use some kind of heuristic in order to group uh, store paths together so that there is better chance for dedupe, but they all suffer from kind of the same fundamental issue of um, the kernel limit. Um, even more so, uh, you have all these perfectly good Nix packages already in your Nix store, and it's kind of a waste to translate them into a slightly different format just so that the Docker runtime understands it. And you also can't leverage any existing infrastructure like the Nix binary cache. So I want to introduce uh, Nix Snapshotter. Um, the goal of the project is to get the container runtime to natively understand Nix packages. Um, a secondary goal, uh, and very equally important one, is to stay conformant with the existing OCI spec and the existing container runtime implementations. So we want to get this working today and have it work with stock Docker, ContainerD, Kubernetes. The API is basically the same as what you see before with Docker tools, name tag, config. The closure of the Nix um, package gets slurped into the Nix uh, con container image. And um, what we do leverage to make it work is this annotations field inside the image manifest under each layer. And we essentially use the key value kind of dictionary to put all the Nix store paths and not inside the layer itself. So you end up with basically tiny layers. And if you have a Nix closure already, and that's, say, let's upload it already to a, to a Nix binary cache, uh, container build and push basically becomes a constant overhead and it's basically instantaneous. Um, just to speak about how it works, um, the container ecosystem actually has quite a good modular system, kind of like Twix. And the Kubernetes talks to ContainerD. ContainerD has this like gRPC plugin system. You can replace subsystems of it with external gRPC speaking services. So the snapshotter is replaced by Nix snapshotter, which understands Nix. Um, some of you may have heard about Nix snapshot already, so I want to just take it a bit further with a feature that you might not know about. So assuming using Nix Snapshotter, you can create an image, and you're managing the, the, the image and the pod in Nix, and then you have to push it to a registry so that Kubernetes can pull it. Um, if you want an immutable reference, you want to pull by digest. You have to go ahead that digest and put it in the image name, and then apply it to Kubernetes. Nix Snapshotter, I'm simplifying here, but we'll pull from the Docker registry and then do bind mounts for the Nix store to prepare the container root file system. The, the image from Nick Snapshotter, when you build it, the out path is actually an OCI tarball. And if you add this magic prefix, Nix colon zero, now is a legal image name, a little bit cursed, but um, Kubernetes would accept it. Um, which means now you could essentially string interpolate the 
the, the value of build image into the image name of Redis pod, apply it directly to Kubernetes, and then Nick Snapshotter will resolve the image and uh, do the bind mounts all entirely from the Nick store. And for the first time, you have a completely self-contained, um, no external state way of deploying a, deploying a pod. So it's, it's open source, um, it works today. Um, there's next to OS modules, home manager modules. Um, notably, it works with all existing images that are not even produced by Nick Snapshotter from Docker Hub. You can, in, you can even interleave um, normal layers with Nick Snapshotter layers, and it's tested end to end. Okay. All right, 10 seconds to go. Thank you very much. You need the microphone. Check, check. Am I holding this right? Are you ready? Sure. Then I'm going to say three, two, one, go. All right. Uh, hello. Uh, I'm Summon Search, and this is uh, news with CUDA packages. Um, the first one, uh, I've chosen the news arbitrarily. The first one is that people used to say you can't access special hardware in derivations. Uh, of course, you can. Now in Nix packages, there is a upstreamed infrastructure to run derivations, which can uh, request access, for example, to GPUs, and in general, request uh, an additional host configuration. Uh, this is a snippet written yesterday, uh, I think downstairs, by P PBSDS. Uh, which uses PyTorch 3D, which we are about to merge into Nix packages, uh, to uh, generate a bunch of random rotation matrices allocated on a, on a, CUDA, on, on a GPU using CUDA that results in a tensor, uh, which is also allocated on a CUDA. It's converted into an uh, Euler angles representation, and here is the result. Uh, you build this magic GPU check thingy, and you see that in the logs of the derivation, you're actually allocating a tensor on a on a GPU device. Uh, we're using this for a couple of tests in Nix packages already. It's, it's, it's upstream. It's not run in any CI in any systematic way yet, but uh, you can use it. Uh, you can use it to also run like real workflow, uh, render pictures and derivations. Uh, the way you configure the host is you set system features with some arbitrary string used to distinguish the special derivations, and then you enable a, a, a Nix pre-build hook, which is going to mount the device nodes and drivers into the derivation sandbox when it's requested. Somebody said pre-build hook is an ugly hack. It totally is, but I think the interface that you use in a derivation is, is kind of OK, which is you have a derivation, you have required system features, you put a flag. If you have a remote builder that doesn't have this CUDA feature enabled, that signals that it wasn't configured to, to uh, it does, probably doesn't have CUDA devices, it wasn't configured to expose CUDA devices, and then the job does not get scheduled to that machine. Uh, so yeah, you can use it. You can use it for other stuff. For example, if your derivation expects that it can write into slash var slash cache slash c cache, you can also signal it that way and set up the appropriate configuration. Uh, and you could even go further. And for example, uh, you could make internet access a system feature uh, and fix this situation. You're offline on a plane or on a ferry, and you try to build a package. And then Nix tells you that it's trying to build a .tar.bz2 package, which is probably something you could have rejected if Nix had any, if we provided Nix with any idea that this is not just buildable, you need internet access. Uh, in other news, uh, thanks to Jonas and uh, MiG92 and Zowok, and uh, thanks to the Nix community project, uh, there is now a CUDA cache. It's unofficial, it has nothing to do with the Nixos Foundation's uh, uh, official Nixos cache. It's separate, uh, all the legal issues are separate. Uh, there are none, uh, I'm not a lawyer. Uh, you can use it, it builds uh, CUDA packages with the like default uh, parameters and CUDA support true. Um, and yeah, you can find more online. Uh, and in yet more arbitrarily chosen news, uh, 
the, the situation with uh, using CUDA in like Docker and Podman containers on Nixos now sucks less because Eris Liber uh, implemented a CDI integration module in Nixos that you just enable and it, and it works. And he's even updated the documentation which tells you how exactly to use that in, in a Docker Compose file and in a command line. I, I, I wish more contributions were like that. It's beautiful because it works. Um, yeah, uh, there's a lot of stuff that is missing. Um, you can ask about it later, uh, maybe on a hack day. Uh, regardless, um, I think I, th I think I'll just cut it here. Thanks. All right. Thank you very much. Our next speakers do not have slides, so you can look at the KDE screen if you want. Is that okay as a background? Perfect. Um, are you ready? We are. Then three, two, one, go! Hi, my GitHub nick is AFH. And my GitHub nick is DWT. Uh, recently, we came across a pull request that removed a single maintainer from a bunch of packages, effectively orphaning them. That sparked our curiosity. And if our possibly too simplistic uh, Nix eval expression is correct, we found about uh, 27,500 packages without a maintainer. So um, we also d dug a little bit further, talked to a bunch of people, and found there's RFC 180, which proposes a process to remove unmaintained packages from the Nix packages store. And that came, uh, or we had the idea of possibly creating a bunch of folks and teams uh, to create awareness about unmaintained Mac packages, calling it the Nix Orphanage. And uh, one of the, um, what we're trying to do today is start a conversation to uh, do people already have uh, something in the works uh, where effectively for these um, orphan packages, uh, a greater awareness is being created and raised so that possibly through tooling, um, GitHub labels could ef effectively show um, which packages aren't maintained. Um, the One of the later goals in the future could be uh, for that team or the Nix Orphanage uh, to find and onboard new maintainers. Um, and what would you think if uh, a, an event like this today would have a two hour or three hour workshop of adopt a package? So, you know, you can adopt your personal package and become a maintainer from these. Um, potentially, one of the um, uh, responsibilities for the Nix Orphanage team could also be to do very minimal maintenance, but the main objective should be um, to raise awareness about these orphan packages. Maybe I'll take the last one. So to start, we'd like to get some dinner, some ramen maybe, after this. And I would love for you to join us and have a talk about ideas, what efforts are actually underway already, and how we can maybe work together and get this started. Or find us tomorrow uh, during the hackathon. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Come on stage, come on. All right, Don't be right. shy. This is yours, right? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Let me know. Are you ready? I'm ready. All right, three, two, one, go. All right, hi, I'm uh, Jonas Chevalier or Zimbatiem. And uh, I thought, this is last minute, but I thought I would present you uh, the Next Community project. It's something I started a while ago, before the Nexus Foundation really was a thing. And I wanted a place where we could get things done, and that was low overhead. Um, at the time, it was hard to make projects official. So I wanted a place where we could just put some repos and, and share them. <coughs> so. Uh, yeah, we are a small team. We're with Make92, Addis Blades, Rantium, me and Zoak. And nowadays, uh, it's mostly Zoak taking care of uh, the infrastructure. So thank you, Zoak, uh, who's not here. 
And just so you know what we provide, so we have like this GitHub repo with a um, lot of repos in it already. <laughs> and uh, you can propose your repository if you want them to be co-maintained with other people. It makes it easier if the location of the repo doesn't change. We also provide the shared build infrastructure with the Arch64, Darwin, Linux, x86-64. Um, we're also running uh, build buttons that you heard about uh, recently. And we also have community builders. So those are big machines where you can get access to. That's useful if you want to have big rebuilds, you don't have the compute power, or you want to test things on maybe macOS and you're also just on Linux. And uh, yeah, you can just request access. You might have seen also this, but uh, doing some things. This is also maintained by us. And uh, yeah, someone George just announced it, but now we're building the CUDA packages and also unfree redistributable packages. And uh, yeah, that's it. It's just a sister project to the Nexus organization. I think eventually it's going to be merged in once we figure the all of the community assembly things. And uh, yeah, if you want something to be done, just reach out to us and we can provide you compute or anything. That's it. All right, thank you very much. Wow, this is great. It's like I was thinking like chess time, like under five minutes is blitz or lightning. So this would be bullet, like bullet chess, except it doesn't make sense because bullets are slower than lightning, I think. So uh, next speaker. Yeah, come up, come up, come up. This is yours going to be a nope. lightning talk? No, that's not yours. OK, which? Uh, this one. This no. one, I guess. That one. Oh. OK, then we'll do a different order. <laughs> All right, I guess I might as well start. So wait, wait, hello. wait, wait, wait. Let me God start the damn timer. it. Yeah, <laughs> you want to be a cheater, yeah? Well, here I want my five minutes, five seconds. I don't know. <laughs> okay, I'm going to say three, two, one, go. All right. Hello, everyone. I'm Gita Sivashkevichus, and I'll be presenting Next Toolbox, or at least part of it. Uh, arrow keys don't work. Brilliant. Yeah, I don't think your computer works very well. <laughs> no okay, let, let me give you some extra time. No. What, what do you need? Uh, oh, you need a mouse? I will need a mouse and You don't know how to arrow. use the clip mouse? I'll need a scroll. Uh, this, uh, come on. <laughs> this, like, oh, it works. OK, okay. I'll, I'll give you 20 <laughs> seconds more, OK? All right. <laughs> So you're for, for, um, for not knowing how to use the clip yeah. mouse. <laughs> All right, so as of right now, Nuke's Toolbox has two integrations. One of them is Helm, which is what I'll be presenting. It's mostly based on Kubenix and OCI. Um, OCI might get merged into Next to Container repository fairly soon, but we'll see. So main features of Helm integration are that resources can be defined as either Nix or YAML expressions. This is mostly used for migrating to Nix. <laughs> um, it provides structure, like, and, like other tools, including Helm, which requires additional package, Helm file. And since it's based on module system, we can do kind of CRDs. Uh, basically, map one attribute set into, I don't know, 10 resources or something. And yeah, uh, this is an example script. Uh, it's an entry point of the whole deployment. Uh, now, only if I could figure out how to scroll. <laughs> ah, the, the middle button, yeah, or like Oh, that. brilliant. So at the top here, uh, we have defaults block, uh, and targets block. One target defines one environment. In this case, we have prod environment and dev. At work, we also have, uh, depending on cryptocurrency, like network or uh, region as well. So there are a lot of cases for us. 
If you guys notice, this is a recursive attribute set. It has like final keyword, and I don't know. At the top, we define the defaults, and we override it at the bottom. Uh, right here, we have an example of overriding just partial deployment resources, and the deployment itself is defined here. We have some issue with formatting. Brilliant. Uh, yeah. Let's take a quick look at the CLI. We can build it and just see what it templates. Uh, plan just diff. Uh, maybe I could scroll it or not. Yeah. Apply is the same thing, only it gives us a nice field. Uh, we have concept of target groups, so you can define whatever you want in a target group. For instance, we do one for live deployments, one for dev deployments, just to speed it up. All right. Uh, that's a second deployment, and yeah. And it's worth mentioning that we have YAML to Nix utility. It's in a different repository as of right now. I haven't migrated it since, yeah, I want to do a slight rewrite. But yeah, it's used to convert YAML definitions to Nix expressions. Oh, that's even wrong. <laughs> I don't like your laptop, I don't know. I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, anyways, thanks for listening. Um, yeah, that's the last slide. Uh, as I said, the repository is Nix Toolbox under Dev Palace uh, organization. That name was created by ChatGPT. Thanks a lot to it. <laughs> and yeah, that's it. Thank you. All right. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry for my computer. Um, it's a shame that you don't like the X220. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Hello again. All right, are you ready? I guess. Yeah, okay, three, two, one, go. All right, uh, so I recently mentored uh, a Google of Summer project for the Nixos Foundation, uh, thanks to Yannick Hag for organizing that. Uh, that was a lot of fun. Uh, I proposed a, a project about sort of a scheduling Nix builds. Uh, the situation is as follows. Uh, you maybe have a flake, uh, you have a derivation A, and you also have a derivation uh, like a dot override q to support true, and the latter one depends on a, a q to version of PyTorch, q to version of OpenCV and NCC, NCCL, uh, MPI, and yada yada. So maybe you have OpenCV CPU cached locally in the store. Maybe you have glibc in the store. Maybe you can download PyTorch from uh, cachedNixos.org, but you can't download TorchQuda because you've updated the uh, Nix packages and uh, now it's a mass rebuild. So, um, uh, say you want to build those A and AQ to test them in a, in a GitHub action, uh, and then you just time out because of the mass rebuild. Uh, is there a good solution to this? Probably not to use GitHub actions in that way. Uh, the low tech solution that came to my mind is that just tell Nix that it can't build more than 100 derivations and then it has to choose only some and then generate a report that, okay, I, have, I didn't test that because I couldn't, it's out of budget. Uh, how could you do that? Well, uh, say you're in the whole your closure of A and AQ, uh, you've got N derivations, uh, you, you, you number them, you can mark uh, the ones that you actually wanna, wanna build uh, with, with ones, so you, you, you generate a, a vector of values, uh, zero for the transitive dependencies, ones for what you wanna build, uh, you, um, uh, depending on whether the thing is cached or is substitutable, you can choose a different cost. Uh, and then you want to find the vector x, 0 or 1, whether you actually do realize the thing in the store. 
uh, what do you want to do? You want to maximize the value, uh, the, the total sum of values uh, that you've chosen. Uh, you want to constrain the total cost. Uh, and you want to make sure that if you build uh, if you build X and X depends on Y, then you also build Y. Uh, that's just an inequality. And TLDR, it's just a linear program, an integer, integer linear program. Uh, during the GSOC, we've uh, implemented the proof of concept. Uh, Sin and Mogd uh, implemented it in, in C using an off-the-shelf uh, iterative solver for uh, mixed integer linear programs. Uh, there's a lot, still a lot to do, but it's a proof of concept. And you can run it, for example, on mentioned earlier, uh, Lama CPP repo, and it, you, you tell it, build four things, and it'll say, okay, I'll, I, I, I won't build CUDA, and I won't build Windows, because that requires a lot of stuff, but everything else, I can get the dependencies from, from Nixos cache and start building directly. Um, we have integration tests. We've implemented a small DSL where you can describe a Nixos test with two machines, a builder, uh, and a remote substitutor, which has some of the derivations in the store, some of the outputs in the store. And then you say, OK, um, here is the graph of dependencies. These things are cached. These aren't cached. And here are the constraints. Make sure that when you run this program, uh, the, the, the generated plan is actually as, as we expected. Um, uh, we tried to do more. We didn't have time to actually implement the whole thing. But instead of like binary costs, uh, like whether the thing is cached or not, you could implement something smarter. Uh, and for example, you could just come up with some scheme to uh, estimate what would be or should be the price of a particular build of a particular derivation, and then just uh, you know uh, uh, constrain the estimated total build time of, of your closure. Mm -hmm. uh, so can you do that? Uh, like, can you do that well? I don't know. Is there an obvious approximation scheme? Yeah, kind of. So what we tried is we have a new derivation. Uh, we're going to look at its input DRVs. We're, go we're going to take its P names because probably all derivations have P names. We'll lose the hash, we'll lose the version, and then we'll just say, okay, here are all the, deriv the P names that, for example, Nixos Hydra knows. Uh, here are all the builds that it knows. Uh, we'll just, uh, for each build uh, of a particular derivation, we'll put a one if it has this P name in the closure and zeros elsewhere. So uh, we, we use this thing to regress the build times. Uh, we get something, probably not very good, but it's something we can train on and, and infer on. And then we, later, with the same interface, then. we can uh, we can come up with a better approximation scheme, I guess. Uh, Five. Yeah. Um, let's chat uh, about it later, maybe. You're gone. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Thank you very much. Sure. Let me get my timer ready. Are you ready? I think so. Great. Three, two, one, go. Hi, I'm Sandro. You've probably seen me on the NixPegaGase repository. Um, I want to deploy a custom uh, NixOS search for the longest time, like search.nixos.org. But it always kind of threw me off that it required an elastic search. And I haven't set up like an Elasticsearch before myself, and it's pretty big, and it requires lots of RAM. So I've always pushed it in front of me and like never actually did it. And a couple of weeks or months ago, um, I talked to a friend, Marcel, and we kind of kicked off Nishto as Search, which solves like some core problems uh, the official search has. Um, for once, it's compiled to like a static website so you can just deploy it on github pages without any backend and it's like really easy to run and probably every project on github can just deploy it within like half an hour at most and and the second one the official nixos search has like that flakes experimental tab i haven't really used it and if you try to use it it has like some accessibility and obvious flaws. So it's like the experimental label is like warranted. For example, the links to the source repository are always in NixOS, NixPKGIS, and like not the real repository. So you get 100% of the time a 404, which is pointless. And yeah, so we built the search. Um, 
It's based on an Angular front-end, and recently we switched the search algorithm to a Rust-based um, one, which is then compiled to Wasm and integrated into the Angular build. Um, also, the Rust backend builds like a custom index file, which shows that way because we want to be like really, really fast and really tiny. Um, we have good support for custom flags. Um, how you could already see on the um, introduction slide. Um, we have Home Manager, for example, uh, NixPKGs or NixWim, all in one. And it's not interactive, but under scope, you can like choose between the different flags and like limit it to like, I only want to search in that flag or in that flag. Um, it's licensed under MIT because why should we care about the license? Just do what you want with it. And we have a deployment under search.nishtos.de with and without the U because not everyone has that on his keyboard. And there are already two community deployments I know of. Um, Nixwim is using it because they have like a shit ton of options and only looking into the documentation is like you don't really know what you're searching for. So we talked them into like, or we suggested to them that they may use our search and they were like, yeah, cool. And also the hackspace I'm from, the C3T2 in Dresden, has like also our own search so that we can search in our, I think, 40 flag imports and like find anything. And yeah, that's what's basically it. You can find it under that orange link. And yeah, I hope some people are inspired to maybe build it into their own custom flags, custom modules, custom repositories, so that everyone can like search in the options more easily and it's like easier to get started with things and you don't need to like read the module source code. So thanks. Thank you. All right. Uh, uh, yes. That's okay, this should be our last one. Are you ready? Are your microphones working? Test. Test? Yep. Yeah. Very, Very good. Well. Nice. You ready? Yeah. Try not to stand on the that thing, there's snakes underneath. Um, okay, three, two, one, go. Hello, we are Ali and Lexi, and today we want to present a flaw we found in NixPKGs that would have allowed us to pawn pretty much the entire Nix ecosystem. And uh, yeah, um, uh, it only took us about a day to st uh, start searching, to uh, reporting it today, and get actually getting it fixed. Um, uh, where was it? Uh, the, the, the vulnerability, it was in GitHub Actions, of course. Um, GitHub Actions can do a lot of things, um, pretty much everything. And um, they are an easy target for attackers, because um, if you have a problem, you can just commit code, and then you have an uh, without authorization, and then you have a supply chain attack. And it's also entirely in YAML. Uh, so, a short primer on GitHub Actions. Uh, an action runs if a trigger uh, triggers it, and there are a couple ones uh, like pushes or commits or pull requests. There's a special one though called, called uh, pull request target. It has uh, a few differences from pull requests and crucially has read write and secrets access by default. It sounds vulnerable, it itself is not vulnerable, but we can just look if it's in Nix packages. It indeed is. So this, for example, is actually a secure uh, thing. It does use pull request target, but the secret is just passed to another action that is completely secure, that's no problem. But, but there is uh, an action called editor config. Um, here's a simplified version of it. Um, at the top, it just um, creates a file called changed files, which is just a list of files, uh, file names that have been changed in um, a pull request that has been opened by anyone. Um, and then it just uh, checks out the pull request. And um, with the pull request, it cats the changed files um, via xargs to editor config checker. And um, you might think, what's the problem? But if you know xargs and have read the man pages, you can see it is not possible for xargs to be used securely. <laughs> um, yeah, there are quite a few ways to uh, attack uh, these uh, with xargs. 
Um, for this example, you could just create a file uh, with a uh, parameter for editor config, for example, help, and then, um, uh, yeah, editor config will be uh, called with the help, and uh, yeah, you would, uh, it would, uh, you would need to uh, audit editor config to find something to ex actually execute code, which we haven't done yet because it was a goal program and would have taken a bit of time, but it is most likely possible to do anything and execute code. And then we looked at the code owner's uh, fl uh, fl uh, workflow. It basically checks out your uh, code, uh, builds from the actual base repository the code owner's validator tool, then runs that on the uh, new code owner's file. And the fun thing is we can just shove stuff in there because it's in the pull request, and it helpfully uh, tells us, yeah, that content of that file is uh, not correct. So we just put in a Zoom link to the runner.credentials, <laughs> and we have a read-write token on Nix packages from GitHub Actions. This basically allows us to write into Nix packages however we want. Also read all the secrets that uh, yeah. Nix packages uses, so cache talk and stuff like that. Um, then I will talk about the fix. Um, yeah, basically you shouldn't mix user input with um, secrets, and if you do, you should be very careful. That's because um, if you have a workflow with secrets, um, and user input gets handled in it, then uh, you can pretty much always extract the secret, be it the secret is written in some shell script that's stored anywhere, and yeah, you should limit all permissions uh, and read the docs. Um, you can do this if you think your uh, organization has uh, yeah, any vulnerable uh, GitHub actions before anything happens, and this is how it was fixed in uh, NixPKGs. We basically first disabled the vulnerable actions on all branches and then uh, pushed uh, fixed ones to, uh, yeah, to affected branches. And yeah. Uh, some thanks to some people. Um, first of all, uh, to Intregus and everyone else at KitCTF. Intregus uh, held a talk about exactly this issue and other things and basically taught us how this works. And uh, shout out to Infinizil for literally fixing this today from uh, arriving here to uh, getting the talk done. And some further resources, the slides are also online, probably soon. The blog post from GitHub is very good if you want to read more up on, on it. It's Three seconds. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you.